SIA Tech Chats. Joining me today is Slade Cutter, partner with the law firm of Whitliff Cutter in Austin. The firm specializes in helping technology and digital media companies succeed in today's marketplace. They're also a preferred legal resource for SIA and its members. So Slade, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, let's jump right in. What would you say are the biggest legal issues um, related to digital media and technology today? Sure. Um, so there's a lot to talk about there. So I'm going to just uh, try to narrow it down to a few uh, biggies. Uh, the first one that um, I, I think a lot of your members are probably at least uh, uh, somewhat aware of is implementation of GDPR, uh, which is going to be taking effect in uh, 2018 on May 25th. Uh, GDPR is the uh, general data protection regulation being promulgated by the uh, European Union. And uh, it has potentially really large impacts even on companies that aren't located in the EU. Um, the GDPR it standardizes uh, and strengthens uh, consumer data protections and laws for, for users across the EU. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, it really expands the EU's uh, uh, territorial regulatory uh, enforcement scope, right? So. Um, the GDPR will be enforced not only against uh, companies located within the EU, um, that, that they're gonna, it will be enforced against all organizations, regardless of their physical location, that offers goods or services uh, to, uh, or, or monitors, importantly, or that monitor uh, the behavior of EU individuals. Um, so if you are an online company that is uh, offering goods or services into the EU, or if you're uh, 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 an online company that is uh, monitoring the market behavior of EU individuals, and that, that extends to things uh, as common as uh, uh, behavioral data uh, collected through um, implementation of cookies, which is fairly widespread, then, uh, then you have uh, potentially have compliance obligations under the GDPR. And you also have potentially uh, some exposure for violations uh, of, of the GDPR. And uh, one of the probably the most newsworthy or uh, uh, um, important aspects of the, the uh, GDPR, the new GDPR that's coming out in, in uh, next May, uh, is the, uh, the penalty structure, which is quite, um, uh, in my view, quite dra draconian. Uh, you can be fined up to 4% of your, uh, your, your, your revenue as a company for violations. Now, that is obviously a, a kind of a worst case scenario, so um, I don't want to be overly alarmist about uh, how that's going to be rolled out and, and, and so forth, but uh, it does represent a very, very significant uh, kind of shift in, uh, in the world of uh, international uh, kind of uh, digital media. Uh, regulation. So that's probably number one. Um, after that, I'd say uh, number two is really just an ongoing uh, issue relating to uh, TCPA compliance. Um, and the uh, TCPA is uh, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. I think I have that acronym right, but in, it, it, effectively what it does is it just requires anybody who, who is uh, calling a, uh, a sales prospect, um, uh, it requires them to get uh, prior express written consent. And if you fail to do that before calling them, uh, on the, especially on, on their uh, handset, their wireless handset, uh, it can result in pretty significant uh, fines up to uh, $1,500 per call, per violating call. And so because a lot of uh, digital media and online companies kind of have a calling uh, uh, or a telemarketing um, uh, aspect to their operation, uh, it's an important one for, for a lot of my clients. Um, and also I should mention the TCPA, uh, it, it applies to uh, SMS messaging. So uh, sending out messages, uh, text messages that are of a marketing uh, nature could also potentially be subject to the TCPA consent requirements. Um, and uh, the kind of the third area that I've been watching is uh, around 
uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And uh, for, for those of your uh, viewers who may not know this, uh, uh, about this statute, it's a federal statute that effectively gives um, uh, uh, service providers or um, uh, website operators is the, kind of a, 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 a typical scenario, um, immunity uh, from any kind of liability relating to the nature of the messages uh, or the nature of the content, I should say, that is uh, posted on or through uh, their service, so long as uh, the, the operator doesn't have a uh, uh, kind of an editorial role with respect to that content. And so folks like Facebook, and this has been in the news recently, very recently, like yesterday, uh, rely on this uh, statute and the, the immunity that's provided in the statute uh, to uh, to avoid liability for uh, obscene or uh, defamatory uh, content that may appear on their platform. And what we're seeing uh, in the courts is a, a, a much more receptive attitude toward claims that fall outside the usual uh, ambit of uh, publishing torts. And, um, and the, the courts are increasingly willing to place burdens on uh, internet service providers that host third-party content. And so, um, you know, Section 230, as you might expect, is a very important uh, aspect of, uh, of doing uh, business on, 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 on uh, the internet, especially for uh, technology platforms like Facebook and many, many others that, uh, that, that um, host third-party content. And so as we're seeing that protection kind of uh, get whittled away, uh, it, it does present um, a, a legal uh, issue for, for companies that engage, you know, in that kind of, that provide that kind of service. Um, and then, you know, the last thing that I would mention on, in terms of big issues uh, for digital media and online businesses is, is uh, just with respect to net, net neutrality and this has been in the news for years now, but uh, with uh, the new administration and the appointment of new FCC Chairman Ajit Pai, uh, we're looking at a very uh, at an administration uh, that's pretty hostile to the to the concept of net, net neutrality and has expressed a, a, a uh, objective of uh, changing um, the uh, the rules that were uh, put in place to preserve net neutrality uh, by the the prior administration. So that could potentially have a very, very large uh, impact on, on uh, online businesses. So um, those are the four areas I would highlight as being you know, front and center for legal developments in, in my area. I wanna ask you about um, privacy and security because as an industry, we talk about this a lot, right? But we don't talk no. about it from a legal in, you know, implication standpoint. Right. So what advice would you give companies to develop a privacy and security policy in order to minimize any legal exposure? Yeah, that, that is a, a very good question um, and something that I deal with uh, daily. Um, the number one thing uh, with respect to uh, data, data privacy and security um, is to, and this sounds obvious, but uh, should be said, um, Folks really need to understand what data they collect, right? How they collect it and how they store it. Um, this may seem obvious, but I've I've uh, talked to many clients uh, who, uh, you know, they start a small business and it grows, and the layers just kind of accumulate over time. The technology layers just kind of accumulate over time, and you've got different uh, uh, business units that are doing different things, building different products, and all of a sudden you've got a completely different uh, profile with respect to what kind of data you're, you're collecting, how you're collecting it, how you're using it, and how you're storing it. And there's just a, a there, there, it is very easy for a uh, significant disconnect to, to arise uh, with respect to, um, you know, what, what uh, a, the, the leaders of a given company may, may think they're doing uh, with respect to data and what they're actually doing. So, I think it's important to keep that conversation kind of alive uh, and, and active for the 
the, the duration of your, your business really because it's important to to always have a good concept of, of what what your what kind of data you're collecting how you're using the data and how you're storing it um, beyond that I would say um, you know implementing reasonable security measures to protect the data uh, and, and <clears throat> what those reasonable uh, measures are uh, vary somewhat um, but I would, <clears throat> if you don't have someone in-house to help you figure out what those reasonable met methods are, I would strongly recommend uh, uh, finding uh, outside help uh, to, to establish those reasonable security measures. Um, one of which very well could be, and in, in my opinion, really should be uh, front and center for most companies in terms of their uh, security um, approach is encryption. Um, and the reason I focus on encryption so much is that uh, in the event that you do experience a, a data breach where you know consumer information uh, is uh, is released uh, and exposed, uh, as long as you have that data encrypted um, and can show that it's can show that it was encrypted and can also demonstrate that you didn't also somehow lose the key to that encryption in the data breach, then you don't have to necessarily, in most cases, um, uh, go through the, um, the remediation process for a data breach. You don't have to notify and remediate because, in effect, what the law is, is basically saying is that, yeah, there was a data breach, but it's, it's encrypted and therefore doesn't create any vulnerabilities for the individuals that, were, that would have otherwise been affected by that breach. So encryption is a is a is a big piece, and, and as part of your uh, you know uh, reasonable security measures that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's always insurance. Everybody loves insurance, um, and uh, there's plenty to choose from out there uh, for cyber insurance. This is an evolving uh, field for underwriters still, um, and I'm seeing a lot of variability in terms of what kinds of coverage is being offered. Um, and the devil's in the details on, on an insurance policy for sure. Um, and so you'll, you, if you do go down that road, which is a, is a very good road to go down um, if you're trying to limit your exposure for things like data breach, um, you'll want to review uh, the, the policies carefully, uh, you know, talk to uh, a trusted insurance agent Possibly a, a, a lawyer as well to help you walk through some of the uh, the, the language that you find in a, a insurance policies can be quite confusing. Uh, so cyber insurance is is a is a uh, is another thing that that I think folks should consider with respect to um, to the to the uh, uh, risks that, that you that you mentioned. Um, and then lastly, I think. Uh, you know, the, the recent uh, Equifax uh, issue uh, illustrates pretty clearly the danger uh, from a PR perspective of just sitting on a breach, right? Uh, so if you discover a breach, um, don't just sit on it. Do an immediate uh, root cause analysis, determine if a response is required, and if it is, you know, bring in the necessary legal and PR professionals to, to help you mitigate that risk effectively. Um, you know, as we learned from the Equifax breach, uh, failure to respond promptly can can make matters a lot worse. So those are those are the four main things. There's a bunch of other stuff, obviously, that you that that you can do to uh, mitigate that risk. But I would start I would start with those. That's great advice. Let's talk a little bit about new business ventures. We we have a lot of entrepreneurs out there. They they build an application or a solution, and they kind of want to run before they before they walk, right? So what kind of, yep. and especially with regards to IP, they don't always know when to protect their IP, how to protect their IP. What safeguards do companies really need to put in place to protect their IP? Yeah, it's a recurring issue in my practice. Um, so uh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I mean, it's, first of all, I think it, it, it's important to delineate what kind of IP we're talking about, right? Because if we're talking about, uh, you know, your trademark, your brand, that's a different question, right? And it's a very straightforward answer. Uh, you know, I think most companies should, uh, should, should go through the trademark process, protect their, uh, their, their marks, 
Um, it's relatively inexpensive, um, can be a bit uh, time consuming and it can take a, a while for uh, the, the USPTO to kind of uh, uh, issue your registration, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fairly straightforward uh, way to, to, to protect your brand. Um, if we're talking about um, content um, or software uh, or um, other copyrightable um, uh, content, then uh, you know it's, I think it's important to have a a, a good uh, monitoring and enforcement uh, program so that you can. Uh, determine when your copyrights have, are, are potentially being violated and, and take appropriate uh, appropriate action. Um, uh, I, I could go into a lot more detail on that, but I, I would, I guess I would just refer your, your viewers to a webinar that we did, I guess, back in May, I think, or a few months ago on copyright and trademark. And Rihanna, maybe you can put a link in whatever you post uh, with, with this, um, with this, uh, interview and, and so folks can kind of refer back to that webinar because I go into a lot more detail about uh, trademark and copyright there. Um, now, if you're talking about uh, potentially uh, patentable uh, technology, um, that is a you know patents is a is a specialized area of law, um, and certainly from a patent uh, filing and prosecution perspective, that's that requires someone who's who's really focused on uh, patent issues, which I'm not. And um, <clears throat> if, you, if your company is developing something that could potentially be patentable, then I, I really strongly advise um, folks to talk to a patent lawyer um, as soon as possible because you can actually file a provisional application for a patent uh, that'll last for a year. Um, I think they're relatively um, inexpensive relatively, um, and uh, it will kind of buy you some time uh, and get you get your technology on file as, as, uh, as being, uh, pr you know, uh, prior to any subsequent uh, potentially uh, competing technologies or infringing technologies. So that is a good route to go. That being said, um, tech folks tend to think in terms of patents uh, to a much larger extent than is really warranted um, because most stuff in my practice anyway, most technology that I see is for one reason or another not patentable. Um, and so uh, so, so uh, uh, folks should, should look for other ways to protect that, that, type, of, uh, that type of information. You, usually that would be considered a, uh, a you know, trade secret or a uh, or, or copyrightable uh, kind of, uh, uh, content as opposed to something that'd be um, subject to, to patents. Um, I guess beyond that, uh, what, one thing, so one thing I see very frequently is, you know, a couple of, and you kind of alluded to this in your question, uh, but, you know, you get a couple of uh, smart folks together, they come up with a business idea, and one is the business guy and one is the, the, the tech person, and uh, and they, uh, you know, are everything's going great, and they're building a product and what have you. And uh, but they they never uh, they never take the step of actually assigning that uh, that product, the the, the uh, intellectual property rights in that product from the individuals to the company, right? And so uh, this can create all sorts of problems down the road. If the, for example, if the if the if it's a piece of software, for example. If the developer for that software, who was a founder, then kind of just disappears and does and does his own thing and never assigns that uh, that technology, the his 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 rights to that technology into the company, then uh, it, it can it can be a big problem uh, if uh, if you're looking for investment or looking to sell or it just can be a big problem in general. So having founders kind of assign their IP into the company at a at a, at a very early stage is a, a mistake that I see a lot and that can be easily avoided. Um, kind of a similar issue I see frequently is getting um, an outside third party to develop your, your technology. And, 
and failing to have that work done under a, uh, a very an explicit work for hire arrangement, right? So a lot of folks don't know this, uh, uh, but um, the the default position for uh, for example, let's take a, a website uh, developer for example, or a software developer. Um, the default position is in the absence of a contract that says this is being done expressly for uh, on a work for hire basis, and those are kind of magic words that uh, that should be in every developer contract you have with an outside third party. Uh, but in the absence of that kind of magic language, you uh, you don't actually have title to the uh, to the technology that was developed by this third party, and that that title resides with the party who created it. And uh, that's obviously not the intended result for most of these types of situations, and so uh, it can create problems similar to the uh, to the lack of assignment issue I was referring to earlier, where a company doesn't actually own the uh, technology that is uh, that is at the core of their business. So, um, and then lastly, on 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 this question, um, you know, protection of trade secrets uh, is. So trade secrets are, are typically thought of as, you know, your secret sauce, your customer list, your, your business operations that are strategic and unique to, to your company. Um, you know, stuff that's not patentable, maybe not copyrightable and, and, and not protectable by easily by uh, one of the other uh, forms of, cop of IP protection that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Um, it's important to do two things really with respect to trade secrets. Um, and they're just sound business practices uh, anyway. Um, the first is uh, it's important to, to implement contractual and operational protections uh, for your trade secrets. So uh, your employees and contractors should all be uh, under confidentiality requirements and should all um, be required to take you know, uh, steps to protect the confidentiality and, and, of, of, uh, of trade secret information. And that's important, obviously, to prevent uh, um, these types of uh, th this type of information from from getting out. Um, but it's also important uh, in the event that it does get out that you can show a court that you know we look we've we've taken reasonable steps to ensure the uh, the, the confidentiality of this information, and uh, it is in fact trade secret information that has been uh, breached and. Therefore, we are entitled to uh, get a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction or whatever uh, equitable relief uh, you might be seeking uh, to, you know, uh, get that get that uh, trade sec secret information back. If you can't, uh, you know, if, for example, you haven't taken any steps to ensure the secrecy and, and protection of your trade secrets, uh, courts will sometimes find that that uh, that was in fact not a trade secret and the you know theft of that information was not uh, was not a theft of trade secrets and so it can create uh, a legal problem as well as just a practical problem of having to deal with um, your your, uh, your your trade secret trade secret information being uh, um, accessed by someone that you don't want it uh, to access it so those are the main things on IP. Great. Before I let you go, I do want to touch on one other thing that I know young companies well. I guess all companies, but specifically young companies do struggle with, and that's in implementing, you know, equity incentive plans. Um, what kind of pitfalls have you seen? What advice would you give um, for companies on how to, how to approach that? Yeah, that, this is a, a very, also a very frequent problem. So it's something that we should uh, definitely talk about. Um, so the first thing is, again, pretty obvious, but uh, very frequently not, uh, not done. And that is to simply have, an, a, a written equity plan. So if you if you have employees with equity um, that, that's been granted uh, through some other means, uh, it it is uh, it, it just creates ambiguity. It creates uh, problems that you shouldn't have to deal with uh, in the absence of a of a written equity plan. So uh, have, you know have a lawyer draft up your equity plan, implement it and follow the equity plan. Um, and, and so as long as you do that, you have uh, everything kind of lined up for, uh, for, for having a, uh, you know, um, a mutually beneficial 
uh, equity plan mutually as between the company and, and employees um, and other, you know, if you have service providers who are also getting equity, um, it needs all, all of those forms of equity should be granted under a written uh, equity plan drafted by competent legal counsel. Um, uh, the second, uh, the second thing around equity plans, I would say is that, uh, this comes up a lot. Um, it, it has, you have to condition any equity grant uh, on board approval. Um, and the reason you want to do that, so in other words, if uh, you're bringing in a key executive and he's going to get a 1% share, he or she is going to get a 1% share, um, then uh, the, then you'll want to make sure that you kind of hedge that that offer with with a uh, with a, a condition that this this is subject to board approval. That that's just to ensure that if you know business circumstances change, uh, that that you know you can you can uh, avoid uh, any any issues there. Um, and then also uh, this is perhaps even more important than that first concern is that um, if an, if an officer of the company is granting equity without uh, proper delegation from the board, uh, then, you know, if that, if that officer or that founder does not have uh, authority to grant the equity, then uh, that grant could be considered void or, or voidable at least uh, because it's kind of outside the scope of that officer or that founder's authority. So, um, you know, the, the, any offer needs to be conditioned on a, on a board approval and any grant needs to be done pursuant to specific board approval. That's something that's, uh, is, is sometimes missed. Um, the third thing I would say is, uh, about, uh, equity plans is to, it, it, this is very basic, but it's, it's also something I see, uh, missed a lot. And that is, um, the, the equity should be subject to a vesting period. Uh, and this just ensures that, that the recipient of that equity remains motivated during that vesting period. I mean, the whole point of giving equity is to make sure that your, your, the, the, the grantee uh, of that equity um, is aligned with the company and uh, is, is, uh, has, a, has an interest in, in, uh, in making sure that the company is successful. Um, and if you just give all the equity without uh, subjecting that equity to vesting, then that significantly, significantly diminishes the, the grantee's motivation to improve the value uh, of that equity. Um, so just a simple vesting uh, schedule attached to the grants of equity is, is very advisable. Usually what that looks like is a four year vesting uh, with a one year cliff um, and uh, that's, that's kind of industry standard, but you can do any number of different uh, uh, timetables for that. But the idea is to have a vesting period so that um, the, the grantee is rewarded for staying with the company and for uh, working uh, on improving the company's value. Um, another thing that I frequently see with smaller companies, at really all companies, but it, this is more of a problem uh, with uh, small and mid-sized companies, is that uh, there, there, there's just there, the the plan, the equity plan is just poorly communicated to uh, to the recipients of the equity, and so the recipients, you know, depending on their sophistication level, their their age, you know, um, whether they've been through this process before, they may not really have an appreciation for what it is they're getting, and um, it, part of the reason for that, especially why this is a problem for kind of smaller mid-sized companies, there's there's no secondary market. For uh, for equity uh, uh, in a in a in a privately held company, uh, typically, and and so um, it takes a bit of messaging um, to explain why this is valuable. You know how it could potentially turn into a a big a big deal for the employee in the event that the that the company uh, you know either goes public or is acquired, um, and and so. That that really has to be communicated effectively to the uh, the recipients so that you maximize kind of the mo motivational um, benefit of of an equity plan. Uh, and the last thing is um, with respect to um, valuation. So companies need to make 
sure to pay close attention to the valuation rules uh, under uh, uh, Section 409A of the tax code um, because failure to comply with uh, 409A has really uh, significant tax consequences um, for the company and for the for the employee. Um, the days of you know nominal stock and discounted options are long gone. Um, so stock can't be given away or sold for less than fair market value um, as determined at the time of grant. Um, and so uh, best practices uh, with respect to valuation of, of those stock grants is, uh, is to secure a third party evaluation, um, which can be time consuming and expensive, although those prices have gone down a lot in the last you know, 10 or 15 years that I've been watching this. Um, it used to be that you, for a company evaluation, you'd be looking at minimum uh, 10 to $20,000, but there are um, a, a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of businesses that have uh, kind of uh, seen the opportunity of providing business valuations at a, at a lower price point, and so you know the the that pricing uh, has gone down quite a bit. You can still spend uh, quite a bit on it, especially if you're a bigger, more complex uh, company with a with a complicated revenue model, but uh, Nowadays, you can get a 409A valuation of, you know, kind of a, a simple one uh, for a couple thousand dollars instead of, you know, five to ten. So it's a very good thing to do if you're contemplating uh, equity grants and it protects you from uh, exposure under under that uh, IRS uh, regulation 409A. Slade, that, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time and all the great advice today. For more information on, on Whitliff, Cutter, Austin, and their expertise, you can visit their website and, of course, um, join us back here next week for SIA Tech Chats.